Linda Boyer, aged five in her school on Farley Hill High Street, could hardly wait for school to be over to get on her bike with the other children. She knew it was a good day because they'd been let out into the school playground during the dinner hour and this hadn't been possible for ages because of the weather. Even though Broadmoor Institution was seven miles away, east of Farley Hill, she still knew it by name. The other children called it a loony bin, and she called it a loony bin, but she didn't really know what that meant. It was a place she put mad people, she knew that much, and so she thought it must be a bin for mad people. But a black cloud was about to cast its shadow over all of them, and for one, it would shut out the sun forever. The black cloud was John Thomas Straffin. Extract from Escape from Broadmoor The Trials and Strangulations of John Thomas Straffin by Gordon Lowe. This was John Straffin, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. So John Thomas Straffen was born February 27th, 1930. His father was a British army soldier. He had an older sister who was regarded as a high grade mental defective and she died in 1952. When Straffen was two, his father was posted abroad. So the family were in India for about six years. They returned when Straffen's father took a discharge from the army and the family settled in Bath. In the October of 1938, Straffen was referred to Child Guidance Clinic for stealing and truancy. June 1939, he was now at the juvenile court for stealing a purse. He got two years probation for this. Straffen was nine and his probation officer noted that the child had no idea of probation or the difference between right and wrong. The family were under pressure and Straffen's mother had no time to help, so he went to a psychiatrist. From this he was certified as mental defective under the Mental Deficiency Act of 1927. In 1940, after assessments, Straffen's IQ was at 58, which is that of a six-year-old, and Straffen, he was 10. During 1940, he was sent to a residential school for mentally defective children. Two years later, he went to a seminar school. He was said to be a loner who took correction badly. When he was 14, he was suspected of strangling two geese. At 16, another IQ reviewed, putting him at 64, or that of a nine-year-old. This had him discharged from the school. March 1946, he went back to Bath, and the Medical Officer of Health said Straffen still fell under the Mental Deficiency Act. He had a few jobs here and there, and landed in a clothing factory as a machinist. Early 1947, Straffen started to break into empty homes, stealing small items. July 27, 1947, a 13-year-old girl appeared at a police station and said a boy named John assaulted her, but Straffen didn't come up. Six weeks later, John had a fight with a girl and as revenge, strangled five chickens of her father. He was arrested for this and believed to have done a string of burglaries too. In his interview, he spilled to a lot. He was remanded to custody, examined by a medical officer and certified mentally retarded. October 10th, he was committed to the Horton Colony under the Mental Deficiency Act of 1913. Horton was an open colony and they specialised in training mentally disabled offenders to resettle back into the community. With Straffen in on this occasion for burglary, he was certified not violent or dangerous. At Horton, Straffen was well behaved and again a loner, isolated from others. July 1949, he was moved to the lower security hostel in Winchester. At first he was doing good, 
but soon he fell into his old ways when he stole a bag of walnuts. And so he was sent back to Horton in February 1950. Also in 1950, he began acting out more. He left without permission to go back home, and when police came to take him back, he resisted, frightened them back. 1951, Straffen was examined in a hospital, showing damage to his cerebral cortex. By now, he had been rehabilitated enough to, that he could be that he could have unescorted home leave. This free time he used to get a job at a market garden. When this was found out, he was allowed to keep the job as it seemed to make him happy. Horton would give Straffen permission to care for his mother. When Straffen turned 21, he was reassessed and advised to continue his certificate for five more years. The family argued against this and appealed. From the appeal, Straffen was examined again on July 10, 1951. A change of opinion was made that Straffen improved to a mental age of 10 and this time recommended an extension of 6 months with discharge possible at the end. So July 15, 1951, Straffen was going to the cinema, alone. He was walking on Camden Crescent when he came across 5 year old Brenda Goddard picking flowers. According to his statement later, Straffen offered Brenda a better place for flowers. He picked her up over a fence and at some stage little Brenda fell and hit her head. While unconscious, Straffen strangled her, leaving her body out in the open and he went on to the cinema. When Bath police found her, they launched an investigation and Straffen was a suspect and was interviewed on August 3rd. Before the interview, police went to Straffen's employer checking his movements, and this snooping had Straffen fired on July 31st. In an interview later with a prison psychiatrist, Straffen said his hatred to the police, how they shadowed him for years and how he knew he was under suspicion, and he wanted to piss the police off. August 8th, Straffen again was going to the cinema, alone. He met Cecilie Batson, who was nine. He took her to a different cinema, then onto a bus to a meadow called Trump's. At the meadows, he strangled little Cecilie. The movement in the crime had many witnesses, the bus conductor, a couple in the meadows, and a policeman's wife. The day after the murder, the wife told her husband that she saw the pair. She guided the police to where she last saw them and there they found little Cecilie. Her description of the man had Straffen an immediate suspect. August night, police drove to Straffen's home and arrested him for the murder. Straffen gave a statement admitting to killing Cecilie and Brenda. He was charged and remanded in custody. October 17, 1951, Straffen stood trial for the murder. The only witness to be heard was Peter Parks, a medical officer at Hortfield Prison. He would say Straffen was unfit to plead. Mr. Justice Oliver would instruct the jury about the law regarding this plea. In their country, they don't try the insane. If a man doesn't understand what's happening, he can't be tried. The jury gave the verdict of unfit to plead. With this, Straffen went to Broadmoor Hospital. It was one for the, for the criminally insane. And while here, Straffen worked as a cleaner. So April 29, 1952, while on work detail, Straffen somehow scaled the 10-foot wall at Broadmoor onto a roof of a shed. He was wearing a work uniform, but under it had civilian clothes. Once changed, he escaped. Hours later, five-year-old Linda Bauer was out riding her bike in Farley Hill. Straffen killed her. Within hours after this, he was captured. The next day, Linda's body was found. Before getting back to hospital, police asked Straffen if he killed Linda, with no mention of her bicycle. Straffen said, quote, I did not kill her. 
I didn't kill the little girl on the bicycle, end quote. With that, he was charged with murder and sent to HM Prison Brixton as Broadmoor failed to hold him. The murder trial opened July 21st. Straffan pled not guilty. The defence wanted a jury to decide Straffan's sanity and the prosecution asked for the murders in Bath to be admissible. But an issue came up. That evening, a juror went to a club and while here decided to announce that a witness for the prosecution was the killer of Linda. This had the judge discharge the jury the next day and the trial began again with a whole new jury. The juror who did this idiot thing was made to stay in the courtroom for the remainder of the trial and had to make an apology for his absolute mess up. Straffan's defense had evidence about his mental condition from years before. Prosecution had prison medical officers and psychiatrists to give evidence. The jury returned for an hour and came back with guilty and claimed him sane. Straffan was sentenced to death. He appealed and it was dismissed. The execution was set for the 4th of September. But Home Secretary David Maxwell Fife asked the Queen for a reprieval on August 29th. With this reprieval, he was moved to HM Prison Wandsworth in 1956. Then he was moved to Hortfield Prison after officers found out about an escape plan with Straffan. August 1958, Hortfield became a bit more liberal, so Straffan was moved to HM Prison, Cardiff. May 1968, Straffan was moved to HM Prison, Durham, in the top security E-Wing with child killer Ian Brady. Straffan died at HM Prison, Frankland in County Durham, November 19, 2007, at the age of 77. He was in prison for 55 years, 3 months and 26 days, or 20,206 days. And that is the story of John Straffan. Hit that like and subscribe button and ring the hell out of that bell. Join me next time for the story of Babe Diedrichson Saharias, an American athlete who excelled in golf, basketball, baseball, track and field. She is widely regarded as one of the greatest athletes of all time. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.